If you'll take your Bible and open to the book of Malachi, it's the last book in the Old Testament. And it's the last of the minor prophets. Malachi's name means my messenger. He's one of the post-exilic prophets. And because he's the last post-exilic prophet, he's also giving us the last prophetic message from God before the close of the Old Testament. That makes Malachi pretty significant. He's writing, uh, most people think, uh, shortly before Ezra. So we're talking 480 to 450 BC. The people have returned to the land. By this point, the temple has been rebuilt, but they are spiritually apathetic. And so in Malachi, he's reminding, God's reminding his people of his love. He is warning them about their sin. He is promising to deal with it. He's challenging them to get ready for the day in which he deals with the problem of their sin. And he's showing them how they should respond. And he's giving hope to those who actually do respond in faith. The book of Malachi is, uh, revolves, is revolving around a series of questions uh, that... God's people are asking, how have you loved us? They're questioning God's love. How have we despised your name? What have we done wrong? Why does God not accept our sacrifices? How have we wearied God? How shall we return to God? How have we robbed God? How have we spoken against God? And in Malachi, we learn about the nature of God's covenant. He reveals God's sovereign plan for the world. He speaks of the messenger that God is going to send to prepare his people for the Messiah. And he encourages them to trust in God's faithful love, even when it seems like nothing is happening. The key verse really is Malachi 1.6. I have loved you, says the Lord. Now, we said Malachi is the last prophet in the Old Testament. And uh, that's significant. Last words usually are significant, right? And interestingly, the, the last words in this last prophet are a curse. The Old Testament prophecy ends with a curse, or at least a warning about a curse. As we end the Old Testament, it looks like God's great rescue plan is a failure, or again, at least on the brink of failure. The Old Testament really ends unfinished, you need a new. It ends with some questions. Now, to understand Malachi, I think you have to remember God's plan for Israel. If we go back, what was God intending for Israel in Genesis chapter 12? They were supposed to be a blessing to the entire world. Exodus chapter 19, through their obedience uh, to the, the law, they were going to be a kingdom of priests representing God to the entire entire world. And 2 Samuel chapter 7, he was going to establish a Davidic king who would enable them to be that, uh, to be that representation, that image of God to the entire world. And God's gone to great lengths to make that happen. He's, he's rescued them in a dramatic way from Egypt. And this was like their great salvation event. They, he made himself known to them in that rescue. He's, he's given them the tabernacle and then the temple. He's come to actually live with them. But then, of course, the story of the Old Testament, they just rebelled, 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 rebelled. They were supposed to be a unique nation, but instead they became like every other nation. And so God exiled them. He cast them out of the garden, you might say, just like he did with Adam. And that exile was part of the plan. That's what the prophets come in and say, God is going to use this exile. He's not done with Israel, but exile was a way of God disciplining his people to make them what they were supposed to be. So it was devastating, but the prophets before the exile, they had hope. Israel wasn't faithful. They were going to be judged, but there were all these promises of this tremendous restoration. You remember, for example, one, Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verses 31 through 34. This was the kind of promise they were hoping for before the exile. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. 
But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. What a promise. The days are coming. Obviously, it sounded like awesome things were going to happen after the exile. And they seemed to start when Cyrus kept the prophecy that God had made or kept God kept his promise that he had made about Cyrus sending them back to the land. I mean, it, it looked good. But when they got in to the land again, they saw problems almost from the start. And so they stopped being faithful to the responsibilities God had given them. But then God raised up Haggai and Zechariah. And there was, you might say, a mini revival in Israel. They were excited. They were enthusiastic. They rebuilt the temple. And Zechariah even speaks of these two great leaders, Joshua and Zerubbabel. And he speaks of these future promises. And God says to his people then and there, return to me and I will return to you. And yet here we are, years later. And as we open up the book of Malachi, it still seems like not much is going on. Spiritually, the people are compromising. Politically, they are definitely not a great nation. Economically, they're very, very poor. And so you can imagine, uh, even for those who were real believers, that they might be tempted to look at God's plan and look at the situation and lose faith and just sort of start living for themselves. And that's kind of the context behind the book of Malachi. One commentator explains, the despair and doubt triggered in the restoration community by the apparent failure of the prophetic visions of Haggai and Zechariah soon characterized the intellectual disposition of the era, a disposition that wondered if Yahweh had indeed forgotten his covenant with Israel. And that's a key issue behind the book of Malachi. Thinking, God's forgotten his promises to Israel, so why care about our responsibilities to him? They've given up, and they think it's God's fault. They're blaming him. Now, obviously, that's very relevant. I've been thinking lately about how much of the Bible is God's plan. And I love that. I love looking at God's plan as it's revealed in the scripture. And it really has the power to change us and certainly to bring encouragement to us. God has a great plan. We're part of something much, much bigger than ourselves. It could really revolutionize, revolutionize our lives if we could just trust in God's plan. But the problem is, it's sometimes difficult to believe God. I mean, I wonder what's difficult for you about trusting God's plan. I think one thing that feels difficult is the fact that sometimes it doesn't seem like much is happening. Now, one of the funny things that encourages me is that we're not the first to struggle with that. Sometimes reading through the Old Testament it seems like so much is happening. But there were times in the Old Testament where it didn't seem like much was happening at all. And I think that's especially true as we look at the setting for the post-exilic prophets. And because it didn't look like much was happening, it was so easy for the people to become apathetic and point the finger at God. God, if we're compromising here, it's your fault. If we're not doing anything, it's because you're not doing anything. And so in response, God raises up Malachi. Malachi means my messenger. And that's what this book is about. God is speaking to his people through his messenger. And we don't know anything else about him except for the fact that he is God's messenger. Some people have thought this wasn't a real name even. They say it was probably written by Ezra, but there's not really a good reason for thinking that. I, like all the other prophets instead, I think Malachi's name simply represents his message. Literally, God is here in this book, entering into a dialogue with his people through his messenger. And it's written in a really unusual style. Most of the book is God saying something 
and ask, asking a question. And people, the people of God, asking God a question back and God responding. In a sense, it's a dialogue. Malachi almost feels like a divine counseling session. God counseling his people. God counseling, confronting these apathetic people. And as he does, Malachi really fades into the background. And I think that's important. The last book of the Old Testament, we, we find in the last book of the Old Testament, we find people complaining against God and God coming back and saying, you're not actually seeing the real problem. You're not really seeing the real issue. And this is so key because so often we blame God. God, why aren't you working? Why aren't you doing anything? When if we looked a, a little more closely, we would see the problem is actually with us. After all these years of God working, of God explaining what he's doing and then doing it and then explaining what he did, after sending his people into exile, telling them why they're going to go into exile, telling them why they're in exile, telling them why they went into exile, they still hadn't learned their lesson. And so here comes this book. As one man explains, this book, Malachi, is a strong word of exhortation by which the prophet seeks to have the children of Israel turn in repentance, in confession, and also come to a relationship to the Lord that is vital and saving. I once, a one heard, I once heard one man summarize the, the theme of Malachi like this. In Malachi, the people's sin prevents God's truth from entering in. The people's sin prevents God's truth from entering in. Begins like so many other prophets. You can see chapter one with a title introduction. In, in verse one, it says, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Oracle means burden. It's one of the different words for prophecy. This one, this particular word for prophecy usually comes before messages of judgment. Who is Malachi speaking to? He's speaking to Israel. He's speaking about judgment on Israel. And if you just think about that, it's so sad. Israel had tremendous privileges. And we'll see as we read this book, they knew a lot. They had sacrifices that were to reveal truth to them and also uh, be a means through which they could experience communion with God. They had the priesthood. They had tithes. They had uh, all these rituals which were intended to help them have a relationship with God. But for many, they only knew these truths from the outside. They weren't inner realities for them. And Malachi really confronts three fundamental problems in the people of Israel. Formal formalism, immorality, and skepticism. But he begins with this foundational truth. God has loved Israel. And if you want a simple outline for the book of Malachi, God's love affirmed in chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. Israel's unfaithfulness rebuked in chapter 1, verse 6 through chapter 2, verse 17. And I am's coming announced in chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, 6. Interesting though, this is a, a heavy, this, you have this heavy word, an oracle of, about judgment. We know what's coming, God's judgment on Israel. And yet the very first statement in chapter 1, verse 2 is, I have loved you. And that's speaking from the past to the present. I have loved you. This is the fundamental reality. I have always loved you. One man writes, in the very last prophecy of the Old Testament, and as it were, on the last page of the sacred word of the Old Testament, God reiterates, he repeats the persistence of his love for Israel. And it's nice to spend some time thinking about God's faithful love for his people. I mean, what are some illustrations of that love throughout the Old Testament? It's everywhere. He chose them when they didn't deserve to be chosen. He, uh, he saves them from Egypt and he keeps saving them even though they never seem to give thanks to him. He eventually brings them into this promised land that he's prepared for them. And even as they enter into that promised land, they, they very quickly fail to obey God. And yet God is so faithful. He's so faithful. He raises up kings for them. Those kings end up rebelling against God. He sends prophets to them. He protects them. God's faithful love is all throughout the Old Testament. And yet in spite of all this love, what do God's people say in Malachi? God says, I have loved you, but you say, how have you loved us? They're asking God to prove it. 
what does that say about us as people? The problem so often isn't that we haven't seen God's love in our lives. The problem is we haven't seen it. <laughs> God has demonstrated his love to us in very obvious ways. And we've been present to and we've seen, but in a sense our spiritual eyes have been closed. <laughs> and yet God's kind. And even though it's so obvious all these different ways that he's loved his people, what does he do here, Malachi? He stoops down to demonstrate his love. And he says that his love was, first of all, displayed in the election of Israel, the fact that he even chose a Israel. He says, Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Loved, hated. Hated's a strong word. And, the, and these are brothers. God obviously could have hated both of them. That's what they actually deserved. But you uh, look back at the ex actual story, it seems more like what he's saying here is not simply that he hated Esau. Uh, it's more that he chose Jacob and he didn't choose Esau. The, he, he's given it, us an illustration, really. Here you have Esau and Jacob, and they are brothers, and they're very similar. And you remember, they're, they're both actually not really very great guys. And you look at Esau and his descendants, they become the Edenites. And you can, Edomites. And you can see, just looking at the Edomites, what Jacob and his descendants deserved. If God had just left them, they would have become Edom. They would have been wicked. They would have hated God. And what did God do in response to Edom's rebellion? Verse 3 of Malachi, I've laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert and he's not going to relent in his judgment if edom says we are shattered but we will rebuild the ruins the lord of hosts says they may build but i will tear down and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the lord is angry forever you wonder how i've loved you god says look at the contrast between you and the edomites you're not much different in terms of your ancestry, you're not much different, honestly, in terms of your actions. Both of you have rebelled and both of you deserve God's judgment. And yet God, in his mercy and for his good purposes, has chosen Israel and has pursued Israel and has protected Israel and has made great promises of mercy and kindness to Israel in spite of their constant hard-heartedness and rebellion. The way I look at this is I imagine... Uh, going to an orphanage, a king going to an orphanage, and he adopts a child out of the orphanage. And when the child grows older, in spite of everything the king's done for this child, he's made him a prince, you know? In spite of that, the, the child says, how have you loved me? One thing about uh, adoption that people don't often realize is they're adopting little sinners. <laughs> and so when you adopt, sometimes you think, ah, oh, look at me, I'm adopting. Someone might think, ah, uh, uh, this child will just, when they grow up, will just say, wow, you're so amazing. But that's often not the way it works. The child's not all that impressed. And so you can imagine this king adopts this child and gives him so many blessings. And yet the child grows up and says, how have you loved me? And the king says, uh, look at this. You want, you, want to, you want to know how I've loved you? Here's this other child from the orphanage. And uh, this child has committed treason and this child is going to be hanged and maybe this adopted child's a rebel as well how have i loved you look at this young man from the orphanage he's going to be punished for his sins and yet look at all the mercy i've shown you this passage is picked up in romans 9 as paul talks about the privileges given to israel and he's working his way through god's great plan and he talks about god's election of Jacob in Romans 9 verses uh, 11 through 13 and of course people have objections to God's sovereign choice and Paul says no this is about God's glory the whole universe exists for the glory of God we all belong to God and God is using nations and peoples for a great purpose which is to put his glory on display in saving sinners from judgment if we come back to Malachi, the election of Israel was a proof of God's love. Look at what they deserve and look at what they received. And the same is true with all of us who are believers. God's election is a proof of God's love still, even better than our present circumstances.
I think of how Paul, as he's in prison in Ephesians chapter one, what does he say? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessings. Well, what is, uh, what is an example of that, Paul, as you're sitting there in prison, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world? We need to know these truths. We need to find joy and comfort in these great truths. And Israel will uh, one day see that. God promises, verse five, he says, your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Israel is gonna see the judgment of Edom and it was gonna be a demonstration to them of God's greatness. And they, they were gonna see that it is a big thing to be saved from God's judgment. We don't deserve it. And yet God has chosen to pour out his mercy on us. How has God loved us? <laughs> Look at hell. That is what we deserve. But in spite of God's great love and these tremendous privileges, Israel has been unfaithful to Yahweh. And specifically in chapter one, we see the way in which the leadership of Israel has despised his name and failed to take seriously their responsibilities to God. In verses six through 14, Malachi basically says, it should have been a big thing for you to be loved by God. But Israel, it, you treated it like it was a small thing. You didn't believe it. You doubted God's love. And that failure to believe in God's love for, for them had consequences in the way they related to God and they despised God. And Malachi gets at the fundamental problem for Israel. They, they, didn't, they never gave up ritualistic worship, but it was half-hearted worship. It was formal worship. And this is what always happens when you fail to believe God's love for you. You may stay religious, but it just becomes ritual. The root of all her sins, one man explains, was an unawareness of God's love, her unawareness of God's love. And that's the root of so many of our sins. Why is our religion not, why is our worship and our religious activity not just fired up? Why has it become just sort of this cold, dead thing We've forgotten how much God's loved us. And in order to show Israel what was happening, God uses an illustration and he begins by speaking directly to the spiritual leadership, their priests in verse six. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where's my honor? And if I am a master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts to, to, to you, O priests who despise my name. And he's talking about this amazing relationship, of course, that Israel had with God. They were sons of God. And here it's a smaller to greater illustration. If these do this, then how can you not do this? If a, if a son honors his father and a servant his master, how, how can you not honor me? How can you not fear me? And of course, that shows what God wants from us in worship, honor and a, a holy fear, a reverence and awe. But of course, their hard hearts push back. How have we despised your name, they ask God. Now listen, not fearing and not honoring God while going through the rituals of worship equals despising. They knew what God was coming after. But they don't see. They don't see it. And God says, it, this, is, this is sad that you don't see it because it's actually pretty obvious. And it, it's obvious in the way they were treating sacrifices. As you know, there's this sacrificial system that God had given his people, and one of the problems he had been concerned about from the beginning was that they had been offering sacrifices without the heart. Sacrifices ultimately were to be a demonstration of faith, and now even when it came to the sacrifices themselves, they were looking for ways not to sacrifice when they sacrificed. Verse eight, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not an evil? And when you offer those that are lame and sick, is that not evil? And you can see what they were doing. God was very clear about the kind of animals that they were supposed to sacrifice, but they were just going through the motions. We have to do this, but let's not do this in a way that actually costs. So if we have to do this, let's offer our blind animals, our lame animals, our sick animals. And this is religion without God. It's ritual without reality. And God says, you know this, present that to the governor. Will he accept you or show favor to you, says the Lord of hosts? By the way, that's one of the things that demonstrates this was written after the exile during the days of Ezra and Nehemiah because they didn't have a king, but they did have a governor. But the point is, they're making these offerings to God and yet they wouldn't even give these kinds of offerings to a human governor. 
And so God asks, would, would you? Would you do this? And they know the answer to the question that he's asking. And Malachi gets a little sac sarcastic. Okay, you really think this is going to work? Go to God, verse 9. He says, And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious with us. Let's go to God and ask God for his blessing. And we'll give this gift to him of a, a blind animal. Do you really think this is going to please him? With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any one of you? And listen, because it's easy to get this wrong. So we need to read this with our doctrine of God correct. God doesn't have needs. And so God's not saying, oh, I'm so hungry and I just really want to eat. And then I get this lame sheep. And what am I going to do with this? This is not about God. This is about these people. And what's happening is that while they're giving all these offerings, they were obviously not giving these offerings in faith as if God were real. And what was proof was that if they did believe in God as they were making these offerings, they were acting as if he were smaller than a father, than a master, than a human governor. And so in verse 10, God says he wishes they would just close the doors. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors. And that says something about God's attitude towards empty religion. We sometimes think a little religion is better than none. No, that's not true. This actually reminds us of Isaiah chapter 1 where God says, Stop praying to me. I don't even want your prayers anymore. It's interesting to me. God had chosen this nation, but uh, it wasn't automatic. They needed to obey. Israel as a nation had all these privileges, but they needed faith. We see that at the end of verse 10. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. Why? Verse 11. This is going to be a reason why they need to be serious about the kind of worship they're offering God. They're treating him as if he were something small, but he's not small. And verse 11 proves it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And he's looking forward. He's coming back to his great plan. And he's saying, you're treating me as if I were nothing, and yet look forward. This is what's coming. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. This is what's going to happen. And we have to do that. We, in this world, things are constantly changing. And uh, what is now is not what will be. And so often now, the plan of God looks small. The church even looks uh, weak and sometimes just really uh, sad. And uh, we've got all these things that can cause us to doubt. But it's not always going to be like this. What looks small now is not going to be small later. The whole earth is going to be filled with the glory of God. And so it's like Malachi is saying, it is a serious thing for you to carry on this ritualistic, formalistic type of worship because I am a great God. And the time is coming when the whole earth is going to be worshiping me and my name is going to be great among them and they're going to bring pure offerings to me. And so your attitude now is entirely contrary to the future. And so as one commentator explains, this is not the accomplishment of this present age, but a prophecy relating to the millennial era. The last chapters of Ezekiel show that in the millennial worship, in the rebuilt temple, incense and offerings will be present. And because the Lord will receive this pure worship throughout the world, as his name is recognized and honored in every place, this is the reason why he will, not, why he will really not be pleased with the polluted and heart, heartless service of Israel. And so in verse... 12, Malachi starts talking directly to the priests. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. And I doubt they were literally saying this. But they were saying it by their actions. And what's crazy is that in spite of how they were despising God's name and profaning God's name, they somehow found a way to turn, or, turn it all around on God and act like it was his fault. Verse 13. What weird, but you say, what weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what's been taken by violence or is lame or is sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? And why is this so serious? It's serious, verse 14, because they were spitting on God's character. You curse it is the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices it to the Lord what is blemished. 
Why is this so awful? For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Question, of course, we're asking is how? How is this going to happen? Israel is complaining against God, and God's coming back to Israel and saying, the problem is not with me. <laughs> I've loved you. You are my son. But look at the way you're treating me. This is the kind of worship you've offered me. And he starts talking to the priests and talking about how they have despised his name. And uh, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, he reveals that at the root of their uh, failure to honor him is the fact that they have not taken seriously his character. Even though they're priests who should know God's word, they haven't taken seriously what the word of God says about God. And so Malachi here is, is just exposing the priests for 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 their failure to, to really take God seriously. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. And here he's really going to end up talking about Deuteronomy chapter 27 and saying that everything that I promised in the Mosaic covenant would happen if you didn't take the covenant that I entered into you with seriously, with you seriously, it's going to happen. Why? Uh, verse 5, or verse 3, Behold, I will rebuke your offering and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away. This is like serious shame. So you shall know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. And here he's talking about what happens when people actually honor the covenant that God made. There's, there's blessing. Uh, there would have been blessing for Israel here. Why were they not experiencing it? Because they didn't honor God's name. God had kept his promise. He, he kept his covenant when his people actually honored him. But what were the religious leadership actually doing? Verse 7 of chapter 2, For the lips of the priest should guard knowledge. The people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he's a messenger of the Lord of hosts. That's the way it was supposed to work. But you have turned aside from the way. You've caused many to stumble by your instruction. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instructions. And so this is what the leadership was, was doing, and this will be the result. God is going to despise them and abase them. And again, God's helping his people understand. They're pointing the finger back at God. They're pointing the finger at God, saying, God, this is your fault, and God's pointing the finger back at them. No, this is not my fault. You want to know why things are the way they are? Look to your spiritual leaders. They're not spiritual leaders at all. But it wasn't simply a problem of spiritual leadership. There was a problem with the people as well, which Malachi is going to expose in the rest of chapter 2, which we'll look at next time. The people have failed at the very at the most basic levels of morality. And that is part of why God's judgment was coming.